So apparently these talks are half an hour, and I'm told that if I actually do it in half an hour, I'll be the very first person who managed to do it. So there's a worthy goal. Um, um, so I, I heard, I don't know, I was asking who is around, and people said there are mathematicians, and there are artists, and there are educators. Uh, so I'm speaking, uh, this talk is here to the mathematician, artist, educator, um, <laughs> wherever you are. Um, so um, I put this picture up because it was one of, my, one of my first inspirations, which I then later realized led to a lot of the things that I did in life when I was five years old. Our Uncle Ned got my brother and myself um, a set of dinosaurs from the Marx Plastics Company. Um, and we spent hours and hours and hours putting them together and telling stories with them. You'll notice there are things that are not historically accurate. There are actually words came in at the same time as there were dinosaurs. And if you look here, you'll see a brother. Where I come from, they believe that. <laughs> oh, excuse me. Yes. Um, okay. Who am I? And it's an evolution. Yeah. So. Um, so, um, but the, the the key thing was that there was a very rich space for us to explore. Um, and then when I got into the so-called real world, I started working on, I, you know, I was naturally drawn to fields where you could explore things. I worked on this film, uh, Tron. The interesting thing about Tron was that um, we tried to do an awful lot with an awful little. All the tools had come from the computer-aided design community, so everything we made tended to look very machine-like. And in my own evolution, um, I had, you know, I'd been attracted to things like Disney's Fantasia, you know, the early real one. And, um, and so I kind of was thinking, this is a very limited palette, and I started pushing, you know, because I had some art background and some math background, and I wanted to put them together to figure out ways we can make things more interesting and combine these two worlds. So um, I developed some procedural techniques. This is called a noise function. I circled that little piece right there. So if you look very carefully, you see that in any one area, it's actually quite simple. It's just implemented with um, pseudo-random spline. You basically take the 3D lattice and you, at every integer point, you have a table lookup to get a pseudo-random gradient thing to just fit splines to them. So it looks random, but it's actually quite repeatable. And an important thing about it is it's not just repeatable, but it's also um, statistically repeatable. It's got very, very nice statistical properties, all the energies like the within one octave. And that means, from an artist's point of view, who may not be thinking about things like statistical energy and octaves, um, it means that they can use it as a kind of paintbrush to, to sort of beef up procedural things. Um, so here, you know, here are some things people have done with it. Somebody um, uh, who was doing some interesting work on translucency simulation said, oh, why don't we just add some of this to create some variegated surfaces. Um, it's just a solid block where it would be a cube um, as a kind of a level function, but then I just threw noise into it and the level function moves around. Um, and here, um, this thing that apparently looks quite different from the first thing you saw actually is just a fractal sum of noise functions. You just keep saying, let's add some noise, then double the frequency, add the amplitude, double the frequency, add the amplitude. Do this about five times, and you start getting uh, kind of one over x squared um, noise, which is useful for all kinds of things. Um, so for example, this is a picture that I made after I started playing with this. Um, it didn't take very long to get to this. Um, it's hard to see immediately what's going on here, but the noise itself, the, there's a procedural texture which you might think of as a solid material that implicitly exists throughout space. If you give me a point in x, y, z, I give you back a value. Therefore, if you have some 3D model um, that you've defined in the computer, you just, as you're rendering every single point on that surface, you ask the question, what's its x, y, z, run this procedure, and it returns a value. The actual value that comes from this uh, basically comes from taking something like this fractal sum of noise functions, just a little loop, and using that to um, vary the x um, coordinate of uh, a sprite function, which is basically just a sine function. And so it's actually very, very compact and simple to work with these. Simple enough that actually it's now been embraced by artists who don't think of themselves as programmers. They start using these techniques, putting these little expressions together, which are now called shaders, to make things like this, because they can make them very compactly. Notice that there's just this little wild card of randomness. 
of pseudo-randomness, which is just this little uh, noise function. Everything else is extremely simple procedures, sign functions, loops, etc. And that combination has turned out to be a very interesting way for artists to start inserting the illusion of some of the, the, the um, unpredictability that you get in real life into their work, but in a predictable way. So here are just some images that I found of people who, uh, someone who was really, really into winged statues um, and um, was using this to make a field of grass. For example, this field of grass is a, is a fairly simple shader where they're varying color in this kind of fractal some way. Um, and other people use them to make cloud covers. Um, these are just things I found that I sort of thought were kind of cool. These are some of the earlier attempts to start making terrains. And you can see um, that they didn't quite have it yet. They didn't have control of it yet. They're using a fairly narrow um, range of frequencies on the water, using them not to vary color, but to vary the um, supposed surface normal direction. So that when it does lighting, it looks like it's uh, a bumpy surface. But in fact, it's not a bumpy surface. It's just varying the way the surface responds to um, the incoming light. Um, and then people gradually started getting better at it over time and having more subtle, sophisticated ways of doing these things. Um, this is actually a shot that I found from um, Autodesk site. Um, they, um, they were showing that you could basically use their commercial versions of these tools to quickly throw together a whole bunch of um, shader elements, put some procedural texture in at different times, and combine them with other techniques and start making things that started looking more and more like they live in the real world. Um, that becomes important um, for some things, less important for other things. I would say that for artistic expression, it's not necessarily so important to make things look absolutely real. However, if you're trying to uh, do what Autodesk does with their Maya product, etc., and you're trying to say, we're going to make a movie and everyone is supposed to believe we actually built this thing, that this is a real place, um, the regularity of computer algorithms um, that are easy to implement um, and easy to control tends to make them look too sharp, too perfect, too clean. And so these kinds of procedurally based techniques that insert this noise function allow them to make brick walls or fire or mountains or the very scenes from the Harry Potter movies or Lord of the Rings, etc., which are now generally constructed from um, non-real environments, procedural shaders. Generally, actors are in blank rooms looking at little fake objects and pretending that they're real. And then post-production, most of what you see on those movie screens are built using these techniques. Um, and um, I, I think it, it requires actually better acting uh, because you don't actually have the sets to work it anymore. Um, this was a scene from A Perfect Storm, uh, which used just um, it, any one shader uh, to make these waves in A Perfect Storm call the noise function hundreds of times. So it took hours to render these frames. Generally, what they would do is use very simple versions of these shaders without all the high frequency, small textural details block out where the waves would be, where the ships would be, and then the artists would turn the switch when they were ready to do the final production, and they did these large render farms uh, of uh, computers just cranking away for hours, making these very high resolution, high quality frames. A nice thing about these procedural techniques is you know where things will go. So even if you do these very, very rough versions of things for all your um, evaluation, you know when you turn the switch and add the higher frequencies, the wave will still be in the same place. It'll just have all these little nice details and wakes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this is, meanwhile, I was continuing my experiments. I wanted to do different things with this. This is a volumetric model, but a little more than a volumetric model. Rather than tracing rays of light to objects, I started playing around with ray marching, where I would just march along in little increments along the rays of light. And when I hit a surface, I could define the interior of the surface to have a um, continuously varying index of refraction. So you've got Snell's law, but you've got Snell's law of not of uh, just an air glass interface, but actually the glass inside is continually varied, just so I could see what would happen. And in fact, the light is traveling through curved paths, which I'm approximating with this ray marching algorithm. 
Um, interestingly enough, I, in order to see what these things look like, I didn't want to build a very big complex background. And I knew that the background would be out of focus. So here I'm doing some of the tricks that you see artists do when they use these things. The background here gives the impression that you're seeing a world that's out of focus. In fact, um, that entire background behind this um, variable um, index of refraction um, blobby thing um, is actually just a very simple shader function where um, I vary the color from the bottom to the top and then I just used a little bit of procedural noise to uh, change things a little bit. And if you're only looking at blurry images at low frequencies, if you tune it, this ends up looking fairly indistinguishable from a real scene out of focus. So for many purposes, you can get away with a lot. However, there's a very important les lesson here. These are tools, they end up being very good tools for artists. It's actually quite hard to have the tools automatically tune themselves to be indistinguishable from what people would see. However, they end up being very easy for people to use, um, tweaking a few knobs. So if the person already has a clear idea in their head of what they're going for, they can very rapidly converge on something that looks good. So it's, it's funny, what's easy is, um, is using them as artist tools. What's hard is that using them as completely autonomous simulation tools. Um, this, uh, some of you might, does anyone recognize this? It, this is one of the procedural planets from Spore. One of Will Wright's great innovations was that he's allowing um, all the players who make all their different, there are millions of, of worlds now, and millions of critters in Spore, and it's the first computer game that's very highly procedurally generated. So um, in order to, um, to talk about any possible planet in the system, any sort of color and atmosphere and this and that, he basically has sort of 19 parameters. I think he picked 19 because he was really into the fact that he called the 19 universal constants in physics. Um, although I think he said it was kind of a wink. Um, and so they send you, actually there are 19 words of data that get sent up to the server based on all the things you can do and it just sort of then everything is procedurally generated. So another player can go to a make-believe planet system in this game and they can see a completely different planet. But in fact, the database of all the planets made by all the players is very, very small because it's made by just um, expanding these very simple procedures. Um, which are actually very quick, which as you can see are just a bunch of you know, simple noise functions and things like that. Um, one of the things that I really like about these kinds of approaches is once you build a model and it's got some structure, so for example here I'm doing a little cloth synthesis, and the cloth synthesis I, I create these volume shaped volumes um, where each little bit of shaped volume is a strand of string that exists in a warped space. So when you're defining the string function, you just vary the domain to the function. So instead of it being a string in regular space, it ends up being a string in warped space. So in fact, each string is sort of diving up and down. And then you see you have the warp and you have the weft of the, of, of the threads. And then in order to make vary the string sense of um, you know, the wooliness of it, you just change the threshold of what's the level surface of where um, stuff meets vacuum and vacuum meets stuff. So here I have this little design gallery where once I set up these simple mechanisms, I crank up the noise to make things a little, a little more random. I crank up the, um, the, um, uh, the constant to make things look woolier versus stringier. And then I can quickly get to these nice places where now I have this stuff, this procedural material which then I could apply to all these different places. So very quickly when you're using procedural methods, you learn to make little design galleries, add the randomness in the right place, make the materials you want, and now that becomes a sort of magic thing that you can start applying. And in fact, you can give to artists who don't even think about that. So artists who are more sophisticated with putting these things together, who might think themselves as big as technical directors, can say, here's a, here's a suite of all different kinds of woven surfaces. They give it to another artist who then quickly finds the right one, and they're just tweaking knobs in the scene, which are actually just changing little mathematical expressions. 
One of the things that started happening recently is these, um, particularly not just not so much because the algorithms have gotten better, but because rather than the old clunky world where you had to spend fifty thousand dollars for an SGI, thanks to the game community, we've now got companies like Nvidia and ATI that have supercomputers sitting there as coprocessors on your PC, um, and so you're able to run some of these procedural things down in the graphics processors and start doing some really interesting algorithms in real time. And I like this picture because it shows that in production practice, when people use these techniques, it's not a question of I have a procedural technique or I have some sort of image that I've drawn. They tend to use both and then use the graphics processors to tie them together. Someone will paint a picture on a face, but the picture on the face might be a picture of where there's an oily spot so that it gets shinier, or where the pores should be deeper. And those painted images don't change the color, they change the parameters of, say, how much noise amplitude is there, or frequency, or mix of frequencies, or in a shader algorithm, how much, how, um, what's the exponent on the light source, so it gets shinier or less shiny. And there are entire languages that have now been developed that make good use of these graphics accelerators. So people start being able to do very, very sophisticated things. And I think that was one of the, um, one of the keys to the success of, um, of the Golem character, uh, for example, which I thought was the first really, really successful digital actor. The first one where, yes, it didn't look real, but you completely bought it. You weren't just staring at the artifacts. You were, you were buying into, you know, it was Andy Circus behind the scenes, but then there were layers of digital makeup and um, Bay Rates um, uh, procedural animation team and all these other people who were building this performance. The only reason they could do that was that they could see the results of all their little procedural texture tweaking in real time during production. And then, of course, they cranked it and spent an hour trying for the final but they had things that were good enough. And there are so many subtleties in this that if they were wrong, they would dominate things. The subtlety about the lips and um, the little wrinkles on the chin and the irregularities. In fact, the way things move, the way the skin has to move with um, the muscles um, as the character moves. And now more recently, um, this whole notion of taking this to digital acting has, has moved forward, you know, the Beowulf films and films that are coming out where they're now doing something much more difficult, like let's, let's do a real-time capture of Angelina Jolie and then create a digital Angelina Jolie so we can have a fantasy character that looks enough like the real character and yet does things you could never do with live-action shooting. Um, and some people, I was at a conference last week, the FMX conference in Stuttgart, where a number of people were talking about it might just be a normal part of film production just as now when you see um, an exterior shot, you're never actually hearing the sound come from that actor's mouth. You're hearing the actor went in later and they dubbed in their own dialogue in the studio. Um, and we may get to the point where actors will now, as a matter of course, be um, the digital reproduction of themselves and everything you see will be post-processing. And I think that this is very exciting because it means, for example, you want to see someone who looks like George Clooney, but you want the acting of Paul Giamatti um, in the film. <laughs> and you're going to be able to do that because it'll all be pre-production and post-production. Makes a lot of sense, actually. Um, no, no, no offense to George Clooney, maybe because he would have been clearer. So I wanted to talk now because there are some um, there are some educators in the audience, and I'm an educator, but I wanted to talk about, um, I was able to do the things that I've done through the years in this work, in game work, in animation, in rendering, and all kinds of things, partly because I was able to um, break out of this stricture that said, are you a scientist or an artist? What are you? Um, and you're only allowed to work on one thing. Fortunately, in the field of computer graphics, um, we have this very, very good acceptance of the fact that you can simultaneously be doing cutting edge mathematical modeling work and also applying um, artistic, um, artistic skills from, uh, from a trained artistic background. 
most of the people who went to work for Pixar, for example, have published, um, you know, in their technical team, have published very impressive mathematical modeling work um, that gets shown in their in their um, in their uh, films. And yet, at the same time, they're darn good artists and they know exactly what they're doing. So um, there was a man who worked at uh, what at the time was Xerox Park, now it's his park, uh, named um, Rich Gold, who unfortunately passed away a few years ago. Um, who had a very nice way of looking at these things. And he said that, you know, there are basically, uh, there's, a, there's a, a dimension of people's thinking from the analytic to the aesthetic. And the aesthetic, you can also read the, I'm thinking about human-centered, societal, important. But we tend to think of science versus art. What questions am I asking? And therefore, what tools do I bring to answering those questions? And then there's this general notion of, am I exploring new territory, or are you really trying to nail down an implementation? And so he pointed out there are four different kinds of thinking, generally. Um, and so he was identifying four kinds of person. What I've been noticing is I've been trying to teach um, a curriculum that goes from computer science to filmmaking to computer games, and we try to bridge these gaps. And I have these computer science students that when you ask them to make something aesthetic, they just look at you like deer in the headlights and they get scared. And you, you try to figure out how to pull them in. I realize that the next generation of people who are going to be very, very powerful in being able to do what, for example, I and other early, earlier people in computer graphics research were doing is people who basically can teach and learn how to think of these not as separate kinds of people, but different phases of your own thinking in the course of solving a single problem. Sometimes you really need to start figuring out scientific principles. Sometimes you just got to say, whoa, what's the big question? Why am I doing this? And who are these people? And what's my value system? And how do I relate to it? Sometimes you need to just perfect a software mechanism or build a piece of hardware. And sometimes you actually have to understand, say, visual communication, principles that are well worked out, but you have to do it well enough. Um, scientists are very often called upon to be good designers, and they're bad at it because they have to create visuals and representations of their work. And a lot of science doesn't actually get transmitted to a larger audience because people don't learn this skill well enough. Um, so we end up getting, you know, some problems, things like this. <laughs> you know, people say, I know, we're just going to give you an immersive reality. I, I don't actually think that that's an actual thing. I found that on the web, and it's one of my favorite pictures. But um, it's very evocative. Future. Uh, so, so, so we start thinking of things that are, you know, sort of more like, more like this. We start doing lots of experiments. If you look, if you decode this image a little bit, you notice that in the background there are a bunch of graduate students. Um, we've been, um, we have a whole program now that's built up to a whole games for learning institute where we're trying to understand how games and interactive experiences can. Um, be used as STEM, that's the, many people know what STEM is before I explain it, that's a few of you, okay, science, technology, engineering, and math, that's NSF speak for, we have to put money into this. Um, and uh, so basically there's this feeling that uh, if there's a pipeline from kindergarten through elementary school, through middle school, through high school, through college, and the pipeline of kids being interested in these topics, science, technology, and engineering, and math, is a little bit broken right around the point they hit puberty. Um, because, you know, that's where they're not just going to pay attention to everything you say. You know, six to eighth grade, ages roughly 11 to 14, you actually have to make it relevant to them and give them experiences that, that, that engage them. And the educational system falls down, and particularly underserved communities, um, uh, women and a number of minorities tend to drift out of these. And so we're losing half of our potentially great scientists um, and thinkers in these areas. And um, they're starting to realize you can't just say, oh, we should do something. You have to apply some science to it. So we are, we are a, um, um, an eight university consortium that's been working together to try to um, systematically understand what engages kids um, in these kinds of, um, uh, what, what makes them interested, what's, what, where does learning happen, when do you, you know, just like you have complementary food groups, you have complementary learning groups. You actually need to engage minds simultaneously in different kinds of ways. You need to be switching at certain rates between high arousal levels and local um, spatial processing and going to strategic processing and reflection. And there, are, and there are ways that have been learned doing these things in other fields that we're starting to apply to interactive media. 
Um, and we're developing new kinds of technologies to do this. We have this really cool kind of sensor technology that now one of my students is going off and forming a spin-off company. Um, he's going to get very rich, and I hope he remembers us when he does. Um, um, basically, it's a, it's, you can think of it as it's a very thin um, film, which is, actually, I think I have one here, that um, basically acts as a, um, uh, as a, as a camera. For, for sensing a uh, high quality camera for sensing imagery. Oh no, no, it's stuck. And uh, it's very, very inexpensive. Um, we actually made it ourselves with just a, a order of various parts. Um, that gives you this subtlety of if I put my hand on a surface, and even if I just move my hand and tweak my fingers isometrically, it picks up all of that. And now there's lots of interest on the part of interactive media designers, feature of ebook, perhaps uh, medical, etc. So now we've got this shiny new toy that we can start applying to use as input for procedural methods that's going to be much, much richer than mouse and tablet. If anyone here is interested in um, playing with that, I should, I should uh, actually hook you up. Um, so I got, the, I got the sign five minutes ago that it was five more minutes, and so I'll be good, and I'll stop here and open for questions. Thank you. Thank you for this very interesting speech, and uh, I guess there are a couple of questions. Okay. Are um, the source tools from NVIDIA, they kind of it's uh, been really like uh, one needed to learn a lot to, 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 to program on those graphical printers like about five years ago. Yeah. And it's getting better and like recently I heard NVIDIA released like uh, kind of general purpose our uh, kind of library. Are we at the stage when I take my C++ code for instance that does some, I don't know, simple practical code are uh, like rather basic like repeatedly applying a certain function to a certain point some general purpose algorithm and just say, okay, just run it on the GPU if the computer of the user has GPU. Are we at that stage? Or I think there's an inherent problem there. I think the way people think, because they know they're dealing with von Neumann machines, um, you know, single CPU, single data stream, um, and the way we've been trained traditionally as computer scientists, means that we conceptualize the algorithms from the beginning as, you know, in von Neumann architectures. What these things are good at is, um, you know, high pipelining, parallelism, fanning out and solving lots of things at the same time and bringing that together again. They're really good at that. Um, so if you try to take the same algorithm and repurpose it, you might be disappointed. Um, what's exciting to me is that there's a new generation of computer scientists that have these things on their desks and they're starting to think, what's the best way to do a sort? What's the best way to do a search? What's the best way to do its processing? They're starting to think of the algorithms themselves in a way that's going to make better use of these processors, which I think is a more honest answer to where we're going to get the most use out of what I think you're talking about. Um, okay, okay. How, how close are we? I'm sorry, what? Okay, okay, yeah. How close are we? I'm sorry. Yeah. How close are we to having a, a Hollywood production of a film by Grace Kelly? Mm -hmm. Um, she's dead. Oh, no. Um, <laughs> um, are you asking how close we are to seeing a dead actor in a new film? Is that right. right? Okay. So, so I think that um, I think that if you could mimic um, the subtlety of the performance, and it's not clear that you could, because the computers are not are not going to be acting for you. They're they're really think of them as digital makeup. If you had someone who could, you know, maybe they could do the later brand number when he was just repeating himself. I doubt they can do streetcar, you know, because that's an inimitable performance. Um, but so if you had an actor that you could mimic their acting performance reasonably well, then I think within the next few years, you, you won't go. There are already a number of shots and a number of films that nobody realizes are digital recreations. Um, and we're getting closer and closer to getting better at that. And uh, there's so much money in it. And Moore's Law is still working. You know, that if you want to, I mean, you know, there, there were plenty of scenes in Benjamin Button that actually just worked, for example. Um, so I think there's reason to think that, not all of them did, but many of them did. Um, so I, I think there's reason to believe that it's fairly close, but 
um, the bottleneck is not going to be the appearance of Grace Kelly. The bottleneck is going to be, can the actress who is pretending to be Grace Kelly actually turn in the performance? Uh, oh, okay. okay. Uh, if someone wanted to learn more about noise, implementing noise function, are there any particular texts you recommend? Yeah, there's a book that a number of us put together called Procedural Mo uh, Texturing and Modeling a Procedural Approach. The first author is David Ebert. Um, and it, it has a contributions from a number of people. Uh, myself and Ken Musgrave and Davey Burt and, Bert and um, I forget there's one or two other people too. And I, we all work really hard to be as, as clear as possible <coughs> about all the different things you could do. That's a good place to start. Could you just repeat the name of the first author? Uh, David Ebert, E-B-E-R-T, like the, like the critic, but David Ebert. Okay. Yeah, just look for that. Texturing and modeling and procedural pros. Get whatever's the latest edition because it keeps making it better and, and everybody should have that on their shelf if they want to implement these things. Two more questions. So the oh, year is I'm oh, sorry. The year is twenty one oh nine. Twenty one oh nine. I have the complete uh, you know works of, of mankind on my desktop. I have Robert De Niro as an algorithm. I've got Angela Jolie you know, in many stages, any stage of undress that I want, you know. <laughs> or Robert De Niro in any stage of undress, if that's what you want, right? What, what am I doing? Um, I don't know. Uh, I'm not sure what your question is. Well, <laughs> my, my question With is... With Angela Jolie, I what, think it's obvious. <laughs> <laughs> what, um, you know, I guess clearly these are all problems that we're going to solve. The, 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 the problem that started as automatic dialogue replacement is now automatic actor replacement, is now automatic script replacement, is now automatic. What am I, the human being, why am I alive in the year 2109? See, I, I think you're making an assumption there which is not contained in anything that I've said. Um, I, what's happening here is that the, the aesthetic questions that don't involve adding something new, we're able to do mimicry. But if you take the mind of a really good actor and you put that mind on a new script, um, I mean, Paul Giamatti, I picked him because he's such a good actor, or Laura Linney, or, or Philip Seymour Hoffman, or like really, really interesting actors, they're not turning in the same performance. There's, you know, we, we, I have no particular reason to think we're ever going to, you know, uh, solve the Turing test. So, I mean, I think the fact that we're able to say, this person is wearing makeup through entirely digital means that makes them look like somebody else is not the same thing as saying, we'll get rid of the choices they make in the performance. So I'm actually not talking about we have a cybernetic version of people's intelligence and how they sell, sell the scene to you. And I think there was an implicit assumption in your question that, that we were going there. That might happen. I don't see that it's happening anytime soon. Well, that's why I'll give you 200 years then. Uh, my, my question is, can, can my, heart, my heart goes out to the future. Uh, the more I see where we're headed with our thinking, I'm wondering why... Okay, that's worth answering. I should answer that. Okay, so, so there's a common misconception. Um, in the, around 100 years or so ago, when the first, or late 1890s actually, when the first cinema started showing up, the very early cinema, and people realized what was going on, um, there were a lot of pronouncements that said, the problem here is you take an actor, they do a performance, you shoot a camera at them, and then you send them home, acting is dead. There is no use for actors anymore because what we've just done is captured a single performance rather than getting on stage night after night and actually getting work. But what we realized was that we didn't get rid of the actors. Instead, we created a much more powerful means for the person who has the talent to just have a channel of distribution of their talent. So now that performance can go out to millions of people. The actor goes and does something else. If the actor has um, an ability to make choices, um, they will act as a higher level creator. They'll always be of interest because frankly, if you make a puppet that just repeats their last per choices, humans are amazing pattern matchers. So eventually humans will say, I don't want to see the old dead Robert Jr. performance. I want to see the new stuff. I want, or somebody else who's infusing something. People are really good at seeing when stuff is fresh and when it's just, oh, yeah, you gave me this and you're tweaking some knobs. So I think we just don't understand yet the nature of how the talent will assert itself 
but I think history shows that people never respond to give me the same old stuff over and over again. They always know when you're providing something fresh. We're just amplifying the power of talented creators to develop more quickly, distribute better, and work with uh, complementary collaborators in a more interesting way. Finally, short question, short answer. Okay. Short question. Well, I can give a long question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's a good question. Now, I'll get an educator. You mentioned one individual should be an actor and, and an artist, an engineer, and a programmer, and designer. When I think about how long it takes to educate a good programmer, a good artist, a good designer, so the person should either have the IQ of 400, <laughs> or, or it, it takes 16 years and then you are close to desire them. I, I, okay, I, I understand your question and my answer is it's a matter of degree. Um, I agree that we can't all be the best at many things. I mean, you know, maybe, you know, George Anthi was a great composer and a great inventor and Hayden Lamar was a great actor and a great inventor. But there are very few people like that. Um, but I think it's very important not to err on the side of, I don't do that, and have a learned helplessness, and I have no idea what you're doing, and keep a hands-off attitude toward entire fields. Um, each of us should be reasonably conversant. We've already won this battle with general written literacy. We don't, I'm an idea person, I need to get the scribe to write it down for me. We're well beyond the point where we think it's, it's useful to just have a small percentage of the population be able to basically express themselves in, in written language. And now we know how much you get from everyone having a basic facility, although of course we still have professional writers who are vastly better than most people, just as you know, they're, they're sort of the writerly equivalent of, of, um, of, um, of great basketball players. Um, but I think that it's very, very important that we make sure that the future filmmakers understand what programming is, and the future scientists understand what aesthetic design is, and that we knock down those walls of, of the academy enough that none of us are just, oh, artists, there's an artist in the room, or oh, there's a scientist in the room. You've seen it happen, and it's completely unnecessary. You don't need to learn all that much to understand why somebody goes to see a, see a retrospective of Jackson Pollock. You know, if there's something going on there, it's not that all those people are crazy, and we should know at least that much about each other. All right. Thank you very much.